Ladies and gentlemen, dignitaries, our respected keynote presenters, and the esteemed participants who joined from around 20 universities around the world, a hearty welcome to Subforum C of 19th Asian University Presidents Forum 2020. Asmin and I'll be the host uh, of this special Subforum C, and I'm from Daffodil International University. And let me tell you that Daffodil International University is proud and honored to be able to host the Subforum C of 19th AUPF 2020. And our heartfelt gratitude goes to Guangdong University of Foreign Studies for creating this wonderful opportunity for DIU to be able to host this session. And uh, let me tell you, by the way, that DIU was the organizer of 18th AUPF in 2019. Today's forum will talk about universities of the future, a better world. And all of us uh, involved in the academia, we know for sure how pertinent this issue is for today's world and for the future. Because for the last uh, few months, universities everywhere have been running their educational activities and their management, and they have been struggling with their sustainability. And that actually gave us a question, where are we heading in future? And we hope that the keynote presentations and the question answer session will be able to guide us to that future. We want to start this uh, session by wishing everyone, wherever you are, uh, we do hope that you are safe and healthy. And uh, I would like to start by introducing you to the respected keynote presenters who are present with us today. We have Dr. Mamad Sobur Khan from Daffodil International University, Bangladesh. We have from Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, Professor Mao Yenhui, Albert Wolf, and Will Hickey. From Michaelis Romaris University, we have Professor Dr. Inga Zalanian. From AGH University of Science and Technology, we have Professor Dr. Hobbs, the engineer Janusz Pico. And from Coventry University, UK, we have Dr. Fred Parker and Frederick Markowitz. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board. So without uh, further ado, let me now request the first keynote uh, presenter, Dr. Mohamed Sobur Khan, founder and chairman of Daffodil International University, Bangladesh, to present his address on virtual mobility and online education for the sustainability DIU in action. Sir, the floor is yours. Okay, I think it's a very good afternoon and thank you all of you. And we understood due to cause of this uh, pandemic time, it is not possible for us to meet physically. But again, thank you very much Guangdong University of Foreign Studies for your excellent initiative to organize this virtual event. At least AOPF, we can proudly say that, yes, we are always committed to meet in every year, whatever scenario is going on we are committed to move forward. And thank you for choosing the right uh, title, Cooperation and Development of Asian Higher Education in the New Circumstances. So I'm just uh, going to give my presentation on the basis of uh, present scenario. I hope that I'll try to cover up 10 minutes. If not, please uh, MC remind me so that I'll try to uh, finish in the right times. So again, thank you very much. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, due to cause of this pandemic, we are already experienced a lot of uh, unknown matter what we are not prepare ourselves in earlier. So that is the one of the reason I chose my topics, virtual mobility and online education for the sustainability and what DIU, the Daffod University is in action. So I like to share some few slides and everybody you know, so I'm not going through the details, 463 million students worldwide have been cut off from education. And everyone we know that the, our setup is now empty. We have a lot of, lot of university, every university we constructed, we developed a lot of resources, but due to this COVID-19, we understood because everything is empty and our student is not there. So that's why we must accept this new normal. And we understood this scenario will not be finished when the vaccine will be coming also. Because the way our lifestyle is changing, I'm sure that everybody agree with me that we should move forward for a sustainable future, considering the present experience 
the planning, the learning, the whatever is coming from our mind. I'm sure that's uh, all of all of our people, the, especially the academician and all of our entrepreneur, creative minded people, innovative people, everyone is busy to produce new, new idea, to make a lot of planning so that we can confirm that a greater sustainable future. And we understood because the educational institute, especially the university need to be sustainable. Because as I already mentioned, because a lot of university already developed their infrastructure, their resources, their research, a huge investment is already done by the various university, considering the student and other benefit. But it is our time to fight and to sustain ourselves, considering the pandemic and other challenges. So what we did it, we just 2010, luckily we took a one initiative. We never thought that this pandemic will be coming, but we are lucky and we are thanks to almighty that we took this initiative in 2010 to give a one student, one laptop, which is really giving an unbelievable strength in this pandemic time because our student, they are using the, our laptop, this, uh, you know, that's one of the, uh, problem was that a lot of the students do not have the laptop, but we are lucky that our every student almost have the laptop because we initiated this project. At the same time, we also initiated online best practices for sustainability. We implemented the smart edu system. So all approval, all meeting, all policy, everything, accounts, store, you know, the transport, communication, you know, the medication, everything we are bringing through the smart edu system. So I, I know that uh, our time is very short. So maybe if you agree, we'll, we'll love to send you the smart edu some details. So I hope that uh, it is our time also to share best practices among us. So we also initiated a go edu because a lot of students getting enough time. So we give them some free course through go edu platform, go edu.ac. So students, whenever they don't have the class, they, they are not able to go to the outside they enter to the go edu site so they can learn a lot of this soft skill. Again, this is the, another great achievement we done from the Dafford University is called the Blending Learning Center, which is called BLC. And uh, you'll be happy that almost uh, 17,000 plus courses we are bringing in this online platform through this BLC. And all 100% of our class is now actively participated through this BLC and our 100% student, 100% teacher, everyone is already engaged through this BLC. And some of the just screenshot I'm showing here, the maximum student participation in BLCs. And you know, the student activity, we can track the all sorts of student activity through the system, student participation, student discussion, forum, peer assessment, student feedback, examination, and even that. The how the teacher is performing their course, how much the student accepting it or not, a lot of analytical tools also we develop through this BLC. So it is really a 100% complete solution. And at the same time, everyone, you already experienced that international, internationalization are not stopping. Rather, I should say due to this uh, COVID-19, the internationalization virtuality virtually is very faster than earlier. Because we also organize a lot of e-talks, webinar, collaborative online international learning, online global classroom, various, various sorts of competition we already organized between this time. And I'm sure that every university also did on your own baseline. So that is uh, one of the key area where we should focus that to utilize this trend in future also. As I already mentioned that maybe vaccine will be coming, but we should keep in mind that after the vaccine also, we should, whatever practices we already develop and whatever result and better performance we are bringing through this uh, virtual mobility or virtual interaction, we should keep it up. At the same time, you saw we already organized a one international summer program as business, social business summer program, which is a, is a virtual mobility interactive. Usually every year we organize it with the help of our Nobel laureate, Dr. Yunus. So these times also due to cause of this COVID-19, we are already, because from the 100 universities already participated around the world. So we are really confident after organizing multiple events, multiple interaction exchange, that it is opening a new era in new normal life. So we should continue our university. And I hope that 
AOPF can play a very good role to bringing the, all of the best practices through this networking. Just I'm giving a glimpse of continuous our mobility and interaction, the how we are organizing. We also organize a one Women Entrepreneurship Congress, the almost, you know, there's uh, more than 150 speaker in the worldwide, all of the giants, uh, some of them is the president, some of the former president is joining this program. And we also organize, uh, you know, the virtual farewell ceremony, you know, with a lot of our foreign students, those who are uh, eager to go back to their country. So they are not waiting for the convocation, physical convocation. So we organize the virtual farewell ceremony for all of our uh, foreign students. And I hope that, and we are using some uh, robot also for organizing this event. And I hope that you love it because the AOPF is always very prominent to organize a lot of the memorandum of understanding. But you know that uh, due to cause of this COVID-19, we Dafoe University and one of the Philippine University, both of we are already doing our MOU also in virtually. So some picture shot I'm giving here. So make you understand so that the, we don't need to go to the now to the any university physically. I'm sure that the virtual platform is ready now to organize this MOU and a lot of other understanding also. And we are also set up, you know, this uh, seeing the, all of this trend, all of this uh, uh, struck and lockdown. We develop a lot of the classroom. I hope that I'm showing some few of the classroom in our university. And so that the student can easily feel that, yes, they are in the physical class and they can interact with our students. So, so we are really enjoying our uh, teaching style, especially our students are really enjoying. Our teacher is also enjoying. And we also uh, set up some online courses, like as I already mentioned, uh, you know that our uh, higher secondary uh, examination due to cause of this pandemic, it is also not able to perform. So government is giving the auto promotion from the auto promotion so that the student, those who will be coming to the university for uh, this free time, we also organize the, some online courses for this HSC student. Well, now the next, what we can do. So it is time to upgrade into a win-win focused, technology-oriented, sustainable online platform for the higher education institution. So I hope that AOPF member will play a very key role and we should make a bondings among us so that we can make a one sustainable online platform. So we developed a one online sustainable platform we call International Open University. I love to invite to all of you, please join with us. It will be a great forum so that uh, we can open to the, all of the partner universities so that we can easily exchange student, we can exchange faculty, we can exchange research, we can exchange our course, we can give some three credit or six credit or nine credit. So by this way, I'm sure that our university also can get the benefit. So this, uh, as I already mentioned, because the focus is this one as a win-win situation. So it will be meaningful, it will be effective partnership in the world, right? And I hope that you will agree with me that the education is now coming in the smartphone. So that's why we, I think this picture will say some few words. Uh, I'm sure that we should now, it is our time to upgrade us virtually and upgrade us virtually for a sustainable future to keeping us united together. Well, so I hope that uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to cover up with some few points. So let's, we'll enjoy the other presentation from the other distinguished guests and maybe we'll uh, go through the question and answer session after this, uh, all of the presentations. So thank you very much and wish all of you good luck. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Uh, as we always say that COVID-19 put a lot of restraints in our life, but it also created a lot of opportunities. And Dr. Khan actually expounded those opportunities that BIU utilized during this time. Now, uh, moving on, we will hear from Professor Mao Yanwe, Vice Dean of Faculty of European Languages and Cultures from Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, China. And uh, she will be talking on the exploration on cultivation model of fostering diversified talents in Faculty of European Languages and Cultures at Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Professor Mao from Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. And I will speak in Chinese, and my translator will translate that into English. Uh, uh, 
第二，高等教育从以教师为中心转向以学生为中心。第三呢，借助互联网和人工智能技术，实现本土化阶段式教育，向利用全球资源实现终身教育的转变。呃、uh, ，so viewing from the current situations, the higher education will develop develop in three directions. The first is that the internationalization of higher education will deepen further, and second is that higher education will transfer into a model of student oriented model from the traditional teacher oriented model. And thirdly, we will use the internet and artificial intelligence, and use the localized and level-based education, and transform that into a lifelong education with our global resources. 随着高等教育思路的调整，西方语言文化学院的人才培养思路也在不断升级。首先呢，作为广外成立最早的学院之一，西语学院多年来一直积极参与学校的国际化办学。是推进学校国际交流工作的重要力量。And as we transform our educational model, the Faculty of European Languages and Culture of GDUFS also upgrades it our own、uh, teaching model. Firstly, as the one of the earliest schools in U- Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, we attach importance of becoming a major part of FS International School. Um, as an international school, and for a very long time, we have been a major part of the internationalization of GDUFS. 尤其在“一带一路”倡议提出以来，学院积极推进学校的呃这个积极响应广外小语种服务国家大战略的思想，新建了多个“一带一路”沿线的欧洲非通用语语种专业。截呃截止到目前，共设置了六个非通用语专业。包括意大利语、葡萄牙语、波兰语、希腊语、塞尔维亚语和捷克语。Especially since the launch of the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative,、uh, we attach importance to serving for the national grand strategy with our minority languages in GDUFS, and therefore we have established many、uh, non-lingual franca language majors, including、uh, Portuguese, Polish. Uh, Greek, Greek, uh, Serbo, Croatia, and Czech Slo- Slovakia, as well as Italian. Uh, 西语学院拥有国际化的教学团队，呃，拥有优越的国际化课程课堂环境。学院聘请的外教呢，一共有专职外教十八名。呃，这个是全校人人数最多的一个学院，外教人数最多的一个学院。And also, we attach great importance to education level or quality. Therefore, we have hired 18 foreign teachers to teach courses in the Faculty of European Languages and Culture. And we have the most foreign teachers in all the departments and and schools in GDUFS. 呃，各语种专业呢，除了拥有专职的外教之外。还通过多种形式邀请外国的专家来广外讲学，每个学期呢组织上呃数十场的涉外的讲座，还积极参加各类的国际文化交流活动。呃、uh, ，except for foreign teachers, we also launch many foreign activities to involve our students in a、uh, native speaking or native culture. For example, we organize over a, a dozen of lectures. By foreign teachers in each semester, and through the activities, we can help foster our students' global vision and foster their cultural awareness. 西语学院的每个专业呢，语种专业均与对象国的高校签有合作协议，与对象国的使领馆呢保持了密切的合作关系。每年都接待大量的这个外国代表团来访，外事交流非常频繁。And the Language majors in our faculty maintain great or significant relations with、uh, consulate generals of these countries in Guangzhou and also embassies. And we remain active interaction with these embassies and consulates in China. 小语种专业的突出特色呢，正在不断的呈现。在去年全国一流本科专业双万计划建设点申报中。我院的法语、德语、西班牙语、俄语和波兰语五个专业入选首批国家一流专业建设点
意大利语和葡萄牙语入选广东省一流专业建设点，我校成为全国非通用语种中获批一流专业建设点数量最多的地方院校。我们争取通过小语种专业打造学院的大特色。And we also strive to create the major features of the minority languages. For example, in the、uh, in the last review of our undergraduate majors. Five majors of our faculty, including French, German, Spanish, Russian, and Polish, were selected into the first batch of national first-class major constructing projects, and we also have Italian and Portuguese majors、uh, selected into the provincial first-class major construction. And we are the largest; we have the largest number of first-class、uh, minority foreign languages、uh, in our country. Uh. 下面是以学生为本的人才培养，呃，西语学院呢以学生为中心，以全面发展和可持续教育为指导思想，在国际化人才培养上做出了多种为本科以及本科以上多层次高等人才国际化培养的新尝试，呃，例如三加一的国际化联合培养项目，呃，那么，嗯，二加二以及三加一的中外双学位的培养项目。还有中外硕士联合培养项目，以及粤粤港澳的万人计划项目。And our faculty also attaches great importance to the student-oriented、uh, teaching approach, and we adhere to the guiding principle of comprehensive development and sustainable education for our students. Therefore, we launch many international and overseas projects, such as the Three Plus One International Joint Cultivation Programs, Three Plus One and Two Plus Two. Programs for undergraduates who can have double degrees from both、uh, countries and universities, and also the joint cultivation programs for postgraduates, and the Ten Thousand Talents program in the Greater Bay Area of Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau. 呃，我们学院还积极参加了这个欧洲校园计划。该计划是广东外语外贸大学与欧洲伙伴院校共同实施与运营的多边教育交流与合作计划。And we also involved in the Campus Euro Asia project, which is a newly launched project in GDUFS. This is to cooperate with six European country,、uh, European universities.、Uh, we want to extend our current cooperation and extend our cooperation into more areas and more majors. 呃，该计划旨在以广东外语外贸大学全球经济治理、区域与国别研究、欧洲语言文学、经济、法律等相关学科为基础，培养具有中国视角和欧洲视野、熟悉中欧文化、政治、经济、社会、服务中欧全面战略伙伴关系的高层次专门人才。And we extend our majors from language to global economic governance, regional and country-specific studies, as well as European languages and culture, economies. Legal studies, etc. Our goal for this campus Eurasia project is to、uh, foster students' vision, a global vision, and European vision, so that they can become more aware of the European culture, politics, economics, social, and to serve for the comprehensive partnership of China and Europe. 呃，这既是实现学生全面可持续发展的新尝试。也是响应中欧高级别人文交流机制精神的一个创新举措。呃、uh, ，this is not only to foster、uh, better student quality, but also an act to respond to the cooperation initiatives between China and Europe. Ah,、uh, we'd be happy if you could finish within a minute because、uh, the allocated time is almost up. Thank you. 开这个尾了。OK， 这是最后一段了。呃，西语学院必将为广外的国际化贡献西语力量，嗯<咳>、呃，充分把握高等教育国际化发展的特征。嗯，直接说。Okay, so since time is limited, uh, we still have a lot to share, but I would want to talk about our future. We will cooperate with uh the universities here present today, and we try to uh become more uh professional in. Teacher and student cultivation. Well, that's、okay. all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.、Um, you're welcome. And、uh, I particularly liked how Professor Mao Yanhui、uh, focused on the、uh, importance of.
having student-centered approach and involving AI uh, as future direction. Thank you so much and sorry for rushing you. Um, now we will move on uh, with Albert Wolf, Associate Professor, Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, China. And his address is on the three M's of future universities, multi-contributions, micro-skills, and mentorship. Over to you, Albert Wolf. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, jump over to the uh, other side over here. If you can't hear me for some reason, please interrupt me, all right? Residents, guests, and delegates, I was so delighted to be invited to give this keynote address at the 19th meeting of the Asian University Presidents Forum, but I was even more delighted to find out the topic is universities of the future. Perfect. I love imagining the future. When I first started writing a futuristic thriller novel, Faceless, in 2010, I imagined what wearable technology combined with social media would be like in the future. And only four years later, Google came out with glasses and I watched some of what I'd written come true. It was kind of a weird experience to see my science fiction becoming science fact. Now, I'm certainly not claiming to have any crystal ball or special powers to see the future. I'd just like to imagine together today Let's apply the same thinking that went into writing a science fiction novel, which is to synthesize the current trends in the news and project them into the story of a possible future about universities. My hope is that this will be inspiring and maybe even a little challenging. So let's imagine for a moment that we zoom forward into the near future, which universities are thriving. I think it depends on what the future needs and whether your university is meeting those needs or not. The main three groups that have needs are communities, employers, and of course, the students themselves. So what do they all need? Well, I think they need something each a little different. I believe what communities need is multiple contributions from the universities. Let me tell you a story. In March 2017, the city of Boston in the U.S. sent out a cry for help. They had a big, complex problem, and no one knew how to solve it. They were running 650 school buses just like these, but they were becoming more and more expensive every year and less and less efficient, and the city was losing millions of dollars and costs kept going up. So they made all the data publicly available, and they kicked off a competition. They called it the transportation challenge. If anyone could give a plan for transportation, even the starting times for the school, that solved their problems and saved them money, then private donors would give $15,000 to the winner. So who won? These guys. Two PhD students and their advisor from a little university down the street called MIT. Their custom-built software did in only 30 minutes what it used to take weeks of manual labor to do, arranging the bus routes and the start times. And did it save the city money? The projected savings was 3 to $5 million every year. Wow. Now, I believe this is an example of what universities should be doing. They are big pools of smart and motivated people but rather than focusing all their attention on classrooms and energy on research inside the school, they should be seeking out ways to make contributions in the real world. Ways that private industries and governments can't. Universities should use the students' learning and research opportunities to solve real world problems and connect with their communities. What if every city and even private citizens all over the world could post hundreds of competitions like the bus challenge and hundreds of university students would compete to see who could solve it? They don't all have to be super tough like that computer science PhD problem. They could be smaller and the prizes don't have to be $15,000. They could just be passing grades from professors. We can't all be Oxford University producing COVID-19 vaccines. But let me ask you some questions. Is your community thankful for your university? What would they miss 
if it suddenly closed. My father teaches high school music in a university town in America, and his students have to do concert reviews for him. And he said 50% of their reviews come from university students' shows. The high school students would really miss the university because it's connecting with the community in a special way. Now, I'm sure your universities are also connecting with the community, but I believe the universities of the future will be competing to see who can make the most meaningful connections and contributions rather than just focusing on granting degrees and doing academic research. But what about the employers? They still want to hire graduates with degrees, right? Well, that's beginning to change too. For example, in 2016, Penguin Random House, the largest publisher in the US, announced that college degrees will no longer be necessary for employment there. Their HR director told The Guardian there is no clear correlation between having a degree and success. He said, simply, if you're talented and you have potential, we want to hear from you, whether you have a degree or not. Then, in 2017, IBM released information that 15% of their U.S. hires don't have college degrees anymore. Two years later, Apple said 50% of their U.S. hires don't have a degree. The CEO said, there is a mismatch between the skills that are coming out of colleges and what we believe we need in the future, and many other businesses do too. And then the big one, just five months ago in July, Google announced they have their own super cheap, super specific skill training certificates that they will consider equivalent to a four-year degree. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, ever since Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard, these high-tech companies love the idea of not having a college degree. But actually, the list is ever-growing. Many industries, including accounting, hospitality, food and beverage, hardware, they're dropping their degree requirements, and not just for any old job either, for high-level and management jobs. Just have a look at some of these companies. These are some of the most major companies in the world. So what do we in the university system do about this trend? Do we ignore it? I don't recommend that. I believe the solution is to improve the details and the transparency of the college degrees. In short, to focus on micro skills. Now, what is a micro skill? I won't go into all the background about the term, but it originated in counseling training and was originally called micro teaching back in the 1960s and 70s. Since then, linguists such as John Mumby have used it to describe all the little things you need to do for a big skill like reading. I think this is the future. For example, when I was a student, I took a community, I took a communication class. I got an A, and it's now on my transcript as something I know. So does that mean I'm a good communicator? Well, I think we all know about the three assumptions regarding college degrees. First of all, there's an assumption that a degree implies that I have some skills in that area. But we all know there's a wide range of students graduating with a really wide range of skills. Some are way better than others, and they all got the same degree. And secondly, there's an assumption that if someone passed a class, that means that they have mastered a subject. But we all know just having an international business course in my degree doesn't mean I can now go out and do international business. And thirdly, and this is the one we all need to be careful of, there's an assumption that if I talked about something in a lecture, the students now all know it. But actually, there's a high likelihood they didn't learn it at all, and you won't know until you check. So let's contrast that communication class for a moment with this guy. This is David J.P. Phillips, and he teaches communication and public speaking, and he's broken it down into a bunch of micro skills. Would you like to guess how many? Go ahead, guess how many micro skills go into communication. Now, if you guessed 100, you were pretty close. 110, and there's the list. These are things so specific like nervousness and swaying. I haven't taken the course, but I imagine he's teaching you not to sway when you're nervous. 
There's also body language, how to use your eyes. Wow, that's a big one. I could imagine there's even micro micro skills for that. And just one example, how to use language to build to a climax. Now, think of yourself as an employer. If I apply for a job at your university, would you like to see just my degree? Or would you like to see my transcripts? Or how about a complete list of every micro skill I have? I'll bet you'd be pretty interested to at least browse it. So I'm convinced this is why Google is counting their certification as equivalent to a four-year degree, even though it takes only about six months to complete. They know these trainings contain all the micro skills that they want their employees to have. The reason so many companies are now saying college degree optional is they need real skills right down to the most specific level, like can you look a customer in the eye and express empathy. That's a micro skill. College degrees typically don't offer that level of specific training, or at least not that level of transparency. So this is probably an even bigger topic than making contributions to your community, but I'd still like to ask you a question. <clears throat> what are your university and teachers doing to keep up with the micro skills trend moving into the future? Because if the employers are already asking for that, it's only a matter of time before the students will be too. And that brings us to our final area of imagination, what do the students need? I'll summarize it in one word, mentorship. What that means is one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with teachers, not one-on-800, one-on-one. And here's a picture of one of my best mentors, my dad, when I was in university many years ago. Lectures and textbooks and content and all of that is so readily available online. What's even the point of having a university where all these people get together? Well, I think it's become painfully clear to us during this pandemic, we need human interaction. From the time we were born, the way we learn best is with somebody emulating them, becoming more like them. Teachers need to be role models, not of having brains full of facts, but examples of real people living, breathing, struggling, achieving, laughing, crying, wondering, doubting, and especially learning together with the students. If you think about it, you are who you are today because of the relationships with the people you knew well. Your parents, your friends, your colleagues, your bosses, and your neighbors, these were your mentors. Were any of them university teachers? Some of mine were. There's these things called massive online open courses, MOOCs. They already have over 100 million students, and that's just in the top five platforms. They are projected to grow 29% per year for the next five years. I think we can uh, say Mr. that these- Albert Wolf, if we may interrupt, um, you have run out of the allocated time and so we want to uh, wrap up your session and uh, I would like to thank you for pointing out how universities and colleges need to involve students to solve real life problems to ensure their future in the job field. Um, thank you so much. Now moving on, we will hear from Will Hickey, Professor of Management, Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, China, and he will be talking about educational massification meeting world demand. Over to you, Will Hickey. Okay, can everyone hear me? Higher education, the new century. Okay. Actually, we're already 20 years into the new century. I've been giving a elongated version of this presentation for the past 10 years, and a lot of things have changed, and I was listening intently to Albert Wolf's talk, uh, I found it interesting, especially the, the comment on one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if we only lived in such a perfect world, that would be the ideal. Uh, unfortunately, I'm dealing at the opposite end of the spectrum with educational massification. That is where we have millions and millions of people in India, China, and 
Africa now, especially with the Idailu or the Belt and Road Initiative coming online who are all wanting to get one-on-one -on -one instruction. But it's a far cry to actually realize that. Uh, that was brought home to me when about 10 years ago, I was in India. Uh, I was working as a Fulbright professor and they sent me to different universities in India. And I remember a couple of them. One was IILM in Ghaziabad. Another was in uh, Bangalore, uh, not Bangalore, what was it? Uh, Pune called uh, Symbiosis. And I remember when I gave my lectures there, which were pro bono lectures paid for by the US government, um, the amount of students spilling out into the hallways, into the corridors, sitting in the doorways, sitting in front of my podium, uh, the hunger for education and trying to meet that huge demand in those areas. Uh, I prepared this presentation, but it would be too long to actually discuss that. But one of the things I work with is pairing people for the jobs that are necessary in their communities. And I wrote a few things down that I got thinking about uh, that Albert Wolf was talking uh, besides the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, he mentioned certifications. So many people want certifications because certifications mean money. With the certificate, you can go out and you can, you can use that to get a job. And, and that's what's really driving the massification of education. Not so much that people want to study for for just becoming Renaissance people, but rather they, they are desperate to move up the career ladder for jobs. And in their own countries, they've been left sorely prepared for employment by the public education system. So that is why we have this hunger, if you will, for self-directed learning, for uh, MOOCs, as he mentioned. How can I get a certification? How can I get a skill? that will get me unemployed so I can move up the career ladder. So uh, let me move this out of the way here. There's things I see that you don't see. The complexity, uh, just issues I wrote down here that I talk about. Complexity of relationship of higher education institutions within the nations they are serving. Uh, I, I'm actually in Jakarta right now as I'm talking about this. And I've done a lot of work in Thailand, in India, in Indonesia, in regards to higher education and schools there. And they, there is so much bureaucracy in just those three, three countries I mentioned, where if you get a degree from a lower level university or a lower ranking university, it affects your employment. Uh, this is not the Dewey system. This is effectively the Nietzsche system. And I talk about that in my classes, the Dewey system. I am a product of the Dewey system where I went back and got my doctorate uh, close to 30 years old, rather under the Nietzsche system like Germany or even in China, your career is set at an early age. And it's very hard to, to have a choice, an option to go do different things. This is especially notable in India. One of the things I noticed when I was in India there and ago, this is several years ago, and I know things have probably changed, but uh, the issue of deemed universities versus uh, the private universities that are there. You can go up and down the street, you would see so many places advertising education, if you will, but many of their degrees uh, are not worth a lot. Uh, we have this issue in the United States also recently with uh, loan forgiveness and students who got degrees from Corinthian colleges. Corinthian colleges were for-profit, they went out of business, but most of their students couldn't find jobs. So what is the ability of institutions to respond to this growing demand? Is it just hanging shingles uh, and attracting people for the tuition money? Or are they really offering knowledge and certifications where people can get employment? The influence of globalization on the institutions, the expectations that the community has. Let me get to the bottom mm -hmm. here. that the community has for, where did I put here? Make this up smaller. Yeah, 
the expectations the community has for the performance and outcomes that these institutions are providing. Uh, where is this information coming from? Well, a lot of data sources are governmental reports, reports by universities across the world of what they need, and research by international to scholars, governments, the populations of developed and developing countries. You know, one of the aspects of this demand for massification comes directly from India and China. If you go back 30 years ago, let's say pre, uh, pre-1990, going back into the 1980s, if you will, many of these big countries, huge populations, but they didn't have access to westernized education. Now, when I first came to China in the early 90s, there were no MBA programs. If you wanted an MBA, you had to go abroad and study an MBA, generally in the EU or Australia or the US. Now, throughout the 90s, that shifted and they started getting joint venture MBA programs, joint venture programs with uh, Ivy League education, with uh, Big Ten universities in the US, with Australian universities like uh, Monash, for example, and Curtin universities, where they would set up joint ventures with Chinese universities where you would study your initial and then you would go to those countries and get the, the final degree, if you will. And now, uh, currently, there are MBA programs all throughout China. Guanghuai, where I'm teaching now, has an MBA program. I'm involved with it. And the certification for that MBA program becomes very important. Certified MBA programs such as AAC, CBS, and uh, uh, APEX and such become very important for attracting students who will pay more because they think they can get more out of that program when they graduate. Additionally, further to that, attracting quality faculty, faculty namely that does research. It becomes a big thing. Research universities. Let's move down here. So the dramatic expansion of this higher education in particular with India and China has led to this issue of massification we have. And when again, when I mentioned massification, I think about the time in India, and it could be any country, it could be Bangladesh, uh, it could be China, uh, the rural areas, et cetera, where if you're offering classes, if people can go to your classes, you will have an exponential amount of students coming. Uh, China has the world's largest HE system with more than 20 million students. This number is only 20% of the university age population, however. India has the third largest enrollment of 10 million students which is under 10% of that age group. Uh, the massification has caused the creation of different kinds of different, or different kinds of academic institutions, as I mentioned, uh, like in Indonesia, India, Thailand, you have the high ranked or deem universities all the way down to basically a family setting up a shingle. We're offering a private university here. Uh, some are quite good. In Indonesia, for example, uh, a very rich family has set up a, a gigantic university system here called Samporna. And Samporna basically has undergraduate and they wanna get into PhD programs and have many campuses. But many of the universities du jour that are of favor are the universities of Indonesia, the ITBs, the Gajamadas. That's what attracts most of the best students. So you have this uh, situation here, like an hourglass, if you will, where the bottom is much more extended than the top. And the hourglass is the very top students who are fee paying go to, or the very top students who are academic and not fee paying go to the Gajamadas, the UEs, the ITBs, uh, the, the, uh, the universities in India, such as uh, Gujarat, et cetera. And then you have this, bottom part, if you will, where the fee paying students, a lot of them go to the private ones. Uh, they're taken if they can pay the money for the places in Samporna, uh, et cetera, the IILMs, the uh, symbiosis in Pune in India, et cetera. So this is how the demand is being met because you have a very limited number of spaces at the top. In China, as you know, at the top is defined by Gaokao, so that is what we're considering when we look at this uh, massification. Where do people get placed? And the growth of private 
education worldwide has been exponential, but again, we get into the details of accreditation and certification. And when I'm talking about certification, I'm talking about certification from the government, if you will. Uh, greater access and more diversity of gender, social class and ethnicity among students and academic staff, that is already being seen. And I think we're down to my last slide here. So the internationalization of higher education is the way countries respond to this globalization impact we have. And there's a lot more I could say, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, certification of the university is what many people are seeking with this massification. Where does your university fit? And will the skills I learn there, uh, the previous Albert talked about micro skilling. What I'm interested in is upskilling and reskilling, especially with universities attracting older students. Can they get the upskilling they need from a current job, especially if they're working in state owned enterprises, or the reskilling they need to do new jobs in regards to digitalization with the underlying current we're talking about here of massification? Thank you, Professor uh, Hickey. And uh, the context that you talked about regarding the countries you visited, it's very similar to Bangladesh, uh, specifically in the rural areas. And uh, that keynote address was interesting because it presented us with a contrasting uh, picture uh, with the previous presentation by Albert Wolf. Uh, now we'll move on with a video presentation by uh, Professor Dr. Inga Zalanian, Rector Michael S. Romaris University, Lithuania. Dear organizers, honorable presidents, dear colleagues. First of all, uh, on behalf of Nicholas Romeris University Academic Community, let me express a sincere gratitude to AUPF for the inviting of MIU team to participate in this significant event. Universities all over the world from the Middle Ages were understood as purely social institutions with their core missions to teaching and learning, research and innovations, and service to the society. Securing their core values of academic freedom and institutional autonomy, which goes hand in hand with the accountability, first of all, to their academic communities, external stakeholders, and the society as a whole. Today, we all understand the necessity of changes which our societies are tackling. First of all, technological progress, also COVID-19 pandemic, status, climate change consequences, economical, political, and other societal concerns. While universities may face different challenges linked to their specific local, national, and regional contexts, some common trends for the present and future of the society can be observed. First of all, sustainability. Mobilizing capacity in our missions to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, both internally but also externally, initiating actions not only in the environmental, infrastructural, but also in the social, economic, and cultural domains of our societies. The path towards sustainability, towards sustainable academia, is quite long. We understand that at first we have to change our mindsets, to change our behaviors, and also the surroundings in our institutions. The transformation of teaching and learning modes 
the way we conduct research and serve our internal and external societies should be sustainable. The second challenge which we all are facing all over the world is digitalization and especially it's actual in the COVID-19 pandemic situation at our institutions. And during the several weeks, we had to change our pedagogies, to change our modes of learning and teaching, transforming our educational experience into remote mode. The pandemic situation also caused the transformation of internationalization strategies in our institution. But we found new ways of communication. We found virtual mobility, which enables our teachers and students to interact with their counterparts all over the world. We have various virtual webinars, conferences, capacity building events, which also adds additional value into our study quality. We are observing the rapid change of labor markets globally. We all understand that, that in hand with technological progress, we will need upskilling, reskilling activities, and universities should play an important role in this domain. Lifelong learning already is becoming uh, a very important component of university activities. Micro-credentialing, integrative, massive, open online courses into our curriculums is becoming a necessity. Understanding the mentioned challenges, leadership styles in our institutions should also change from uh, greatly hierarchical modes to more flattening structures, allowing uh, professional networking, allowing uh, professional teams to take leadership for their qualitative teaching, for their qualitative research activities, and serving the communities. In conclusion, I can say that all mentioned challenges and activities which are happening now in our universities will require more opening, more collaboration uh, between the stakeholders inside and outside our academias. Those common efforts will require strong leadership and courage from all of us. But I am sure that university sector is capable to turn the challenges into opportunities and drive a positive change for a better world for us and for the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Rector, for pointing out the importance of research, digitalization, and bringing change in pedagogy for ensuring that future for the academia and universities. Uh, now we will move on uh, with the keynote address by Professor Dr. Habs, the engineer Janusz Spitzel from AGH University of Science and Technology. Uh, he is UNESCO AGH chairholder of Krakow, Poland, and uh, he will be talking about the, the challenges to the universities in the future. Over to you, Professor. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and in Polish language, dzień dobry. Thank a lot for the kind invitation for the 19th edition of the Asian University Presidents Forum, hosted during the 2020 by Guangdong University Foreign Studies China. And this year, forums take place online for the first time due to the global health situation. The theme of the successful forum in Bangladesh last 2019 was focused on the future of entrepreneurship, education, and experimental learning. 
determines of the developing successful entrepreneurial ecosystem in Asian economies. And one of the sub theme was entrepreneurial education and fourth industrial revolution in Asian countries. So the theme of the forum in China this 2020 is focusing on cooperation and development of the Asian higher education in the new circumstance and especially our artificial intelligence opportunities and challenges for the higher education in Asia and universities of the future. And everybody hope for a better world. So this forum is continuing the discussion about the higher education into new digital era and takes into the consideration the importance of the global sustainable growth approach in both education and entrepreneurship. During the forum 2018, I was focusing on the digital industry and skills for connected world. During the forum 2019, I was focusing on sustainable development and digital industry impact for diversity in engineering education. And this year, I would like to merge the previous targeted tools and focus on the challenges to the universities in the future as a part of the global debate related to the current health situation. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated discussion of new model of the higher education improvement and industrial smart working. We observe today new challenges and needs within education and manufacturing, which should be um, overcome. The pandemic has increased the importance of the certain types of the skills, which has been uh, discussed into the previous talks. Universities and companies uh, with higher level of digitalization have responded better to the crisis. Digital technologies have proved to be very valuable to response of the crisis. Universities and companies must reevaluate existing education and business models or seek new ones to be more resilient. Increasing digitalization in our today um, life provides a unique opportunity to streamline processes and upskill future workers and today's students. Technology supported by the artificial intelligence and people working together harmoniously can improve our activities efficiency. We need new type of educators teach new advanced basic technology system. From one hand, we need trainers which will teach how to perform from teaching language to coding human-like behaviors. We need also explainers, which bridge the gap between technology and practice. We need also the business leaders who can explain how technology works. And finally, as well as sustainers, which will be available to advanced twin sustainable oriented system in practice. Education transformers live and drive sustainable development. Education for sustainable development can provide the knowledge, our herbs and action that empower people of transform themselves and transform societies. The UNESCO Secretariat in the document published during 2020 and then titled Education for Sustainable Development and Roadmap have been focused among other for the following priorities. Transforming learning environments to encourage learners to become change actors who have the knowledge, means, willingness, and courage to take transformative action for the sustainable development. The education institution needs themselves to be 
also transformed. Building capacity of the educators. Educators remain a key actors in facilitating learners' transition to sustainable ways of the life. In an age where information is available everywhere and the role is undergoing great change. Empowering and mobilizing the youth, it is also something very important and key. It's today youth and following generation who will be left to face the consequences on unsustainable development. It is their present and future that they are at stake. An important issue is also the social responsibility of the universities aimed at the inspiring activity focused on sustainable development in the field of science and innovation for the needs of the market, development of the scientific and lifelong term education competences, taking into account multidisciplinary promotion of good practices, in particular in the field of technology and education. We need to competence our students with both basic skills, it means higher education areas covering science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, core manufacturing skills, strong skills related to the core activities that characterize the particular business or industry, twin system skills, including both real and digital technical world, and skills for trustworthy, the artificial intelligence. According to the European Union trustworthy, artificial intelligence should be respecting all applicable laws and regulation, be ethical and also robust from the technological perspective, taking into the consideration also its social environmental. And finally, the transversal skills. Workers will not only need new or advanced technical professional skills, but this must be complemented by transversal skills, such as poorly human feature of creativity and entrepreneurship, personal and social skills on which importance will increase the future as they can't yet easily be reproduced by artificial intelligence, but can complement it. Both universities and companies speed up the digital transformation efforts, will require skilled staff that will be available to work with key digital technologies. Educators, and business have a shared role to ensure that future staff <clears throat> will be well equipped with the necessary skills to fly in the new normal type of the era. Thank you very much for your kindly um, attention and I wish all of yours a lot of health and warm regards from Krakow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Janusz, for pointing out the importance of developing technology and also the social skills for the uh, students. Now, moving on, we have two more keynote addresses, and now I would like to welcome Dr. Fred Parker, Professor, Coventry University, UK, to talk about using COIL projects to equip students on a Sino-UK program with a global perspective, a case study of the Coventry University and GDUFS program. Professor, over to you. Good afternoon. I just share the PPT. I hope you can see the PPT on the screen. Um, yeah. My name is Fred Parker. I work for Coventry University, but I'm based at Guangdong University of Foreign Stud Studies. Um, I teach the students here on the 2 plus 2 program. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about how COIL projects can equip students with a global perspective. Um, these become more prominent 
especially with the COVID-19. And I'd like to use as a case study, a coil project that we're in at the moment. Okay. So the background, I guess, like almost every university in the world, internationalization has been a key word for Coventry for the last four or five years. Uh, stemming from the UNESCO uh, sustainable goals, especially with, to do with education and inclusive, exclusivity of education. Um, traditionally, uh, Coventry would send students out on field trips to different partners in different countries around the world. Obviously, the last 12 months, this has not been possible. Although they've always been running COIL projects, they're now starting to use them to link up all their partner universities around the world. Um, they have COIL projects connected to 50 countries and 100 different institutions. So it's very much a global uh, scale work. If their aim is to have all students have some kind of international experience and now COIL is becoming a, a key part of what they're doing. There is some uh, academic theory behind this. Um, as I say, it's, it stems from UNESCO and the Sustainable Goals, where they talk about giving students a global perspective. I think this relates back a little bit to what Albert was saying about not just using books. Um, there's a lot of debate about what exactly is a global perspective, but a lot of it is to do with skills and preparing students to be able to play a role in complex global contexts, be able to communicate with people in different countries and different cultures, be able to understand different work environments in different countries and what's required. Quite likely in the future, they're going to be working for international organizations. And research shows that COIL projects can contribute greatly to this, especially um, if they have international learning objectives. So there's a link in the, the literature that supports COIL. What is a COIL? Okay, we talk about it. As far as Coventry is concerned, as far as I'm concerned, there are four elements. Obviously, there has to be a cross-border international uh, element to it. Online, yes, asynchronous and synchronous ability to talk and communicate. Both are important given the time differences around the world and also students' ability to actually connect to their internet. We're doing quite well today, but as we know, with online classes, at times, the synchronous teaching, some students can't connect at the right time. So to offer both options is, is ideal. Then to reflect, to re for the students to reflect on their experience, what they've learned, how they will change their habits and how they will change their interactions with people from different cultures in the future. Um, all this is, driven by international learning outcomes. I've seen quite a few COIL set up where people just say, okay, we will do this, but there's actually no focus, no learning outcomes. Um, it's important that like with any curriculum, that cu learning outcomes are very clear and connected and aligned with the project so that the project meets and delivers the outcomes. And give some example of ones that I've used or we have used in previous. And a lot of it you see is about in intercultural communication, intercultural activity. It's not really learning about too much about knowledge. It's how that there are differences between the nationalities and how it affects okay, business. In my case, I, I focus on business teaching. So I'd like to move on to a project that Coventry is doing at the moment. Um, it's called the Virtual World Tour. As I said before, normally students would go out each year and visit these countries and their partnerships. It's not possible. So they have uh, created a world tour where partners in, I think, 22 different countries all take part with their students 
uh, producing videos and material about their country, about culture, about the sustainable goals and how their country is working towards the sustainable goals. Um, you can see it spread quite almost around the world, N not quite South America yet, but we hope to have, maybe we can get some partners there. So there's quite a spread of um, input and different ideas that goes on here. The idea is that the students will create their own videos. They will give presentations to students from other uh, universities. And they will also meet in Zoom um, conferences so that they can talk and communicate with each other. The three different elements that we have included in ours is video, presentation, and written paper. Um, there's a lot of skills involved in doing this, as I've said before, rather than just using books, which I agree with, with Albert, you shouldn't just use books. In all of these, I think a key element is confidence. A lot of the students, if you ask them, oh, can I do a presentation to 100 people? They will say, no, I can't do that. But if you push them and show them how to do it, they do it and they gain confidence. The same with making videos, the same with writing. And I think confidence is a key skill that students will need in their future, whatever they do. But especially if they're going into different situations outside their own culture. Um, it might not get them into Google, but at least if they have the confidence to apply and go for jobs like Google, then that, that will give them a great benefit. Okay, and another speaker mentioned certification being important. I think that was Will, yes. Um, Coventry agrees. Um, and for successful completion of COIL projects, they do provide certification. Um, a lot of the students, I teach are in their first year as university study. So they don't have much to show on a CV or on an application, but if they have a certificate to say that they have taken part in these kind of projects, it actually shows that they have some knowledge, some skills, intercultural knowledge and skills, which they can use. They can even build up an online uh, personal like LinkedIn so that they have these to prove that they have done slowly they can build up a, a, a history of their work rather than just having a degree certificate. They are looking at open badges, which not being very technical minded, I think are digital badges, which will include some of their activities and skills and achievement that they've done, which they can then take with them. So we're talking about the future of universities. To some extent, I think COIL is the future, especially the immediate future. Universities are not going to stop um, internationalization because of COVID um, for the number of reasons, but they're not gonna be able to send students out either. So COIL and projects big or small, I think are going to be the future a number of reasons that you can see on the screen. I mean, for the students, um, you have to think of inclusivity in the sustainable goals. In the past, a lot of students haven't been able to travel, haven't been able to afford to travel on international trips. But COIL, they, everybody can do this, as long as they have the internet, which most, hopefully most do now. But it, it makes it more inclusive. And for universities, yeah, it helps internationalize the curriculum and develop globally minded students. And it also helps universities create links and partnerships around the world. As you seen, saw previously on the map, um, Coventry now has partners and links in over 50 countries, 22 of which are taking part in this. So it helps them cement their relationship. So overall, I think that COIL projects, if they are planned correctly, are the immediate future for internationalization for universities. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Parker. Uh, and we are very hopeful about this call project, which uh, will definitely help uh, in internationalization for the universities around the world, focusing on intercultural collaboration. Moving on with our last keynote address, uh, which will be given by Frederick Markowitz, lecturer of English Language and Business, Coventry University, UK. And he will be talking about a new normal in Sino-UK teaching support, a case study of Coventry University and GDUFS, transnational programs during COVID-19. Over to you, uh, Frederick Markowitz. Uh, many thanks. Uh, let me just open my PPT. So uh, thank you for having us here today. Uh, it's my first time to present at the Asian Universities President's Forum. Um, so thank you for inviting me. So I work with Fred Parker at Gadufs uh, for Coventry University. As a quick background to the program, uh, it's been in existence for over 10 years now. I've been working uh, at the program for 10 years and it's been going on for much longer than that even. Uh, our students study for four years in total, two years at Gadufs and two years in England at Coventry University, after which they can attain a bachelor's degree with honours from the university. And whilst the students are in China, they're not just taught by staff from Gadufs but also three full-time Coventry University teaching staff as well, who are usually on uh, base. Uh, right now, I'm in the UK though. So during the pandemic, uh, we experienced a huge number of challenges. These are just some of these. Uh, and I think not just ourselves, but numerous people around the world uh, encountered these issues. So I think you can associate with some of these. Uh, one problem we personally had was that staff were located across the country or even the globe uh, because this all happened just around uh, the New Year's period when people went back home. So one person was back in their hometown in China. I went back to the UK. Uh, my colleague Fred Parker was on holiday abroad as well. So there were issues there. Um, there were also, of course, the issues of students being in non-learning environments. They were at home, with their, surrounded by their families, uh, which could get noisy at times. Uh, there were internet connection problems. And also the issue was that a lot of staff had problems with uh, well, the lack of knowledge of online design and delivery of modules. That was a serious issue. As uh, Dr. Will uh, said in his presentation, it is really important to have staff who are well trained to deliver that online support. So it was really key that when we encountered these challenges, that we came up with not just solutions, but effective solutions that didn't detriment the uh, teaching quality and the experience that students had at university. So in a recent survey done by, uh, I always have to check, uh, Wonka, uh, a blog, uh, they recently did a survey of 7,000 students across numerous universities in the UK. And in that survey, in that survey they found that uh, a huge proportion, well, a large proportion, I should say, of students were not currently satisfied with their academic experience this term, this semester. And there were a variety of reasons for that, but the key highlights were that um, the interaction with students, other students was lacking and also with staff was lacking. There were issues with technology uh, amongst other things. And students really didn't feel like they were part of a learning community. It felt more like they were studying by themselves at home. Some even said, why am I at university? I can learn this all by myself. Uh, and this of course leads to the risk of dropouts. And right now, a large number of universities are having financial issues due to not recruiting a sufficient number of students. And those that they have recruited, there's still a risk of losing those as well as students begin to think, okay, what is the value of education as a whole to me? 
So when we looked at the challenges and we had to approach those challenges back in February before this survey came out, but we could already assume that uh, we needed to provide a high level of teaching and therefore we had to look at what kind of software worked both in the UK and in China. Uh, so at the time that wasn't so obvious to us as it is today now that we have that knowledge. So of course Zoom, which we're using now, that worked fantastically well between both countries. So yes, there were some connectivity issues here and there, but for the most part, it worked. Socrative was a fantastic way of giving online assessments, online exams, uh, when courseworks couldn't be done. Uh, one thing that I found myself was very useful that not that many people are using it is Screencast-O-Matic uh, for pre-class videos. And the use, uh, yes, you can record videos with Zoom, but the thing is with Screen-O-Matic, it's Screencast-O-Matic, it's much, uh, it makes videos that are of a smaller file size, which makes it easier to share, which was beneficial for students who had low internet connectivity. Uh, we also made use of Open Moodle and WeChat for sharing files and learning materials with our students. Now, it wasn't just the use of tool, well, it wasn't just that we find the right tools to use, but also how we use them that was really important. So traditionally, what would happen in teaching is that the lecturer would present information to students uh, teach new knowledge within the lecture to everyone and then give homework activities that help them to make use of that knowledge, to apply it and create new things with it. Uh, however, that's not very engaging, especially now that things are more online. And therefore, the a model that has been used for about 10 years now is a flipped learning approach. And some of us decided to implement this not just here in China, but also in the UK at Coventry University, where teachers uh, create their own videos that introduce knowledge and watch that in their own time, at their own convenience. And then in the live classes, be they online or face-to-face, -face, they can then uh, practice using that knowledge. And it then becomes a lot more interactive. So going forward, teachers have now become a lot more confident in the development on delivery of classes. I myself definitely have. And therefore, we are able to do a lot more. And even though now face-to-face uh, -face teaching is becoming more common, we shouldn't forget what we've learned so far. Uh, we can now make use of software such as Zoom. Uh, there are a variety of teaching approaches that before were popular, then they became less popular due to the disadvantages they had, such as the flipped classroom model, and now they've become popular again. And also, as my colleague Fred Parker mentioned, uh, the design of COIL projects as well. So Coventry University makes sure that staff are trained, well trained in the use of the software tools in terms of designing COIL projects and also in the use of a variety of different teaching approaches. And there are weekly sessions that are available for staff to ensure that staff are up to date. Coventry University in the UK has also uh, changed its online uh, platform uh, where, for which it does, uh, shares, for which it shares uh, so, uh, learning materials and communicates with students. Before we were using Moodle in the UK, now we're using a system called Aula. Uh, and if I can sh do a new share quickly. Uh, if you can see my screen here, it's just the web page for Aula, which actually shows a bit about how it works. So whereas Moodle, it's, everything is fixed, and it's not real time. Aula is more of a system that's very similar to Weibo or Facebook, a social network like that where students can instantly type things, they pop up and other people can respond. And it could be classmates, it could be teachers. There's also a chat option on the right hand side. One can share links uh, such as video links. 
uh, or even MP3s of one talking. So I've got another uh, GIF here, which shows that. So that way that it feels to the student that the teacher is still there, even though they might be in a completely different city or even a completely different country. So this has been very, very uh, successful uh, based on, oops, oh yeah, and this also works on mobile phone, which was something that didn't work so well on Moodle. And of course, uh, nowadays generation of students, you can't uh, really stop them using their mobile phone. So rather than stopping them, why not accom accommodate them? And this way it actually encourages them to engage with that learning community as well. And since May, uh, Aula was introduced for 100 modules. And within those 100 modules, two thirds of uh, student satisfaction for two thirds of those modules received an excellent score of 90% or more, which was a magnificent achievement, uh, especially due to students being in lockdown and having to study from dormitories or from home. Uh, in fact, module satisfaction as a whole increased by 25%. So what I'm saying here now is that we've learned a lot from this. And once we go back to uh, the campuses, yes, we'll have back a face-to-face -face teaching, but rather than going back to old habits of just giving lectures, uh, teachers can now take on different approaches such as using online tools, such as creating videos, making use of new platforms to communicate with students, not just inside the classroom, but also outside of the classroom and trying to also engage students within, a, uh, within lectures. So making lectures more interactive, turning them more into seminars. And in the past, this has, uh, students have praised this approach to teaching. So thank you for listening. Uh, I hope everything was clear. I kind of rushed that uh, due to time constraints, but if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. And also if there are any of the tools that you find interesting, uh, I have them here in the reference list, uh, such as Screenomatic. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us the very interesting case study. And as you just mentioned, uh, the question answer session. We are actually moving on with the question answer session. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Can can you see? Can anyone see me? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm. Yeah. I'm yeah. yeah. I'm we are Dr. seeing Arthur. all of you. And we are seeing the Unimap Honorable Vice Chancellor. Thank you very yes. much for joining. <laughs> Thank you for your full time joining with us. <laughs> okay. Let us have a hope to see you. Yeah, yeah, right. no, no. Thank, thank you, Professor Badli Shah. Okay. Thank you. Too nice to see you in the chair. Eh? Right. So, so uh, first off, uh, thank you so much for all the keynote speakers. I believe all of these speeches are very, very informative. And some of the ideas that you guys have shared with us are very uh, valuable. I think, especially on the case study, I think that would be a very good example for most of the universities out there. They would like to try the virtual mobility or the virtual online courses and whatnot. I believe most of the universities are actually working towards that uh, amidst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, my questions to, uh, I think I have, my question is not um, directed to anyone. Perhaps everyone who have any thoughts may share. But my question is that um, as comparison with the physical mobility, uh, we have limitation of not having any physical mobility now due to the pandemic. And hence we move on to the virtual mobility. Uh, my question is that how do we um, make sure that the engagement between the, the organizer, uh, the lecturers or the participants and in terms of um, cultural exchange, the academics exchange and what's not can be achieved through virtual and is there any good effective assessment methods that you would like to share with us? I think that's all my question. Thank you so yeah, much. I think that's a, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. We already developed a one assessment tools and you know, the online proctoring and a lot of these tools already we developed. And I hope that maybe uh, next times or another day, our international department will share with you and we'll send you the one presentation that how you're assessing. 
because considering the present pandemic situation there is no way we should encourage the virtual exchange and i hope that everyone you already agreed because uh, there is other, no other way right now and if we can popularize this virtual exchange it will be giving the another mile, mileage because a lot of cases you know the student do not have the financial ability to fly one country to another country so through this aopf and through this uh, partnership networking i am sure that we can very strongly utilize this virtual exchange even the faculty also can participate in the same way so thank you thank you inimap and we will we'll share this uh, uh, solution later on uh, we will send you the presentation thank you all right thank you so much dr sabo uh, maybe uh, any any other input from other universities as well i'd like to comment if i could please yes please I've been working with online education since 2000 uh, when I was a, um, I guess you would say a prototype evaluator for uh, Blackboard at the time when it came out in Northern California. And the biggest flaw that we had with it then and continues to this day is you can never ascertain 100% certainty who is on the other end of the terminal doing the tests and the assessment. We still haven't conquered that yet. And that is the biggest drawback with distance learning, online education, is you can't guarantee who's on the other end as opposed to people being in a classroom and you're administering them a test or a upfront assessment. So, and never, never underestimate the ability of students to game the system. They are really good. I've seen things that I didn't know was happening when it was happening. So I think that that is the fundamental problem with you called virtual mobility, online education, MOOCs, any of this stuff is we've got to ascertain that this is the real end user or else we still have, uh, we still have the skew there of, of who is really doing the assessment. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Right. right. Thank you so much, Dr. Wills. So in your opinions, uh, is the absence or the lack of ability of our ability to confirm the attendance of the student is the, the, the most, uh, I mean, the most urgent issue to be tackled? Or do you think that there's another thing that to be tackled at, at this moment? Uh, well, again, that's the biggest flaw I've the, the biggest flaw I found in the system is trying to determine how do we guarantee, assure that the person on the, on the test taking end, the assessment end is the real person we need with 100% certainty. And that is, that is what separates online instruction from in-person instruction. If you cannot, without a shadow of a doubt, ascertain that you have leakage in the system. And that is something that when we're dealing with high wage uh, employment, we're dealing with credentials that affect health and safety, you better be spot on on that. And that, that is something that I've been dealing with for over 20 years now. So I, I never put it past students to game the system. And I learned that studying under a guy from University of Paris uh, named Crozier. People are very good at adapting and gaming systems and they can get on top of that all the time. So I incorporate that into a lot of my instruction. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Wills. Yeah, right. can I uh, just okay. say, I yeah. mean, one way to overcome that is to have a number of different assessment points, not to have one final assessment but throughout the project or throughout the course have different assessment points and maybe different assessment methods. So they could have a video as part of their assessment. Then they have to do a presentation or a, a portfolio on Padlet or Sway so that they have a different number um, of styles that they use. It doesn't stop somebody doing it for them, but it, the teacher can look at the different styles. The video obviously is a video, so you can see the student doing it. If they do portfolios, online portfolios, you can question or comment on them and try to see if the students understand what they have actually put up on there. I don't have any further questions, but uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, 
knowledge sharing on this, it gives me some reference points. Uh, one thing I have noticed is uh, in regards to what Albert talked about and what Fred talked about and the other participants is that uh, I'm in the business school and I look at some of these things with a different perspective than the others, even though we're all coming from basically the same background in regards to education and learning, uh, the things that I pursue may sound very different than what they're pursuing, but I think we're all on the same tangent. I'm looking at things like localization and jobs creation. And that, that promotes a lot of political stability, which is what I'm ultimately getting at on some of these things. And certifications are great, but I, I use case studies in my classes of how people have managed to gain certifications to get a job, but they really don't know how to do the job. So it's more than just certification sometimes. We also have to look at issues such as coaching and mentoring that were mentioned, uh, micro-skilling, shared learning, all these things in the mix. One area I work with in energy is uh, nuclear energy competencies. And they are very comprehensive because not only do they include the operations, but you have to look at the overall safety in the nuclear industry and how mix-ups or uh, missed skills could affect the safety of a lot of people, not just in the plant, but also in the society. So that gives me a, a broader perspective on, on the need for people to know beyond certifications to pick up red flags and things like that, that they gain with the on the job experience. So that becomes another issue and I don't wanna get off on a tangent, but I do enjoy hearing the other participants and seeing how this fits into the, the big picture. Thank you. Yeah, can I comment on that? I think um, a lot of that problem you have where the skills learned don't match those that are required in the job is down to curriculum design. Um, I think that the people in charge of universities need to work more with industry specifically so that they can have a connection with each industry. You mentioned nuclear industry or the finance industry. So that when they're teaching these programs, they know what the current issues are and what the industry projects for the future. And then these can be incorporated into curriculum almost sustainably. So that the curriculum becomes a sustainable curriculum that it's con constantly updating to meet the industry requirements. I think at the moment there is a lack of coordination between curriculum design and industry. Fred, I appreciate that very much, but there's only, only one thing I wanted to say, uh, if you can hear me on that. And that is, as they, as they taught me in the, in, the, in the business of business, we live in a lowest cost bidder world. So they want it done quick and to the point, and there's not a lot of room to uh, do the summative and formative evaluations. Yeah, true. <laughs> Okay, yeah. I would like to request Dr. Mohammad Sobhu Khan, founder and chairman of Dhabi International University, Bangladesh, to wrap up the session by commenting on the keynote presentation and the question and answer session. Mm -hmm. Sir, Okay, so again, thank you very much. And I'm sure that everyone will enjoy and a lot of the good point is coming from the various uh, discussion and especially I must say the Albert Ulf, I think this uh, your some of the micro skill presentation and giving the skill metrics. I'm sure that everyone will uh, get the knowledge and we'll, we'll try to adapt it. And at the same time, I think that's uh, our uh, Dr. Fred has already mentioned the curriculum sustainability. I think one, one of the key points because we are telling that uh, educational sustainability, right? But curriculum sustainability, curriculum development, come up with the curriculum for the industry and the demand of the market, that should be also one of the key factors. And same time, as Unimap and other people is already mentioned that uh, how we should uh, share our best practices. I am already telling in my presentation that it is the time to share our best practices among the partner university because some of the universities are already developing a lot of the best tools, no doubt. So this is the time that we should share each other. And I hope that those who already have confidence that yes, you already developed a lot of the good tools. So please uh, uh, let inform to the other partner university and give a one exclusive presentation on your best practices. So that the, what happened, we will not focus to any other area, rather just to keeping our mind and keeping our focus to the uh, best practices and we learn to each other. 
So anyway, so again, thank you, Guangdong uh, University of Foreign Studies and all of the distinguished participants. And uh, I'm sure that uh, this networking Asia University President Forum will be in the uh, near future and will be continue also. And I hope that in the 2021, we'll try to meet physically, inshallah, and with good hope and good wishes to all of you. I'd, I'd like to conclude here. So thank you very much again and wish all of you good luck. Uh, we'd like to thank the organizers, Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, for presenting the Academic National University with this opportunity to host the Forum C of 1980 and 2020. We'd like to express our gratitude to the respective keynote presenters for sharing their brilliant ideas with the participants today. And we would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the participants for participating in this session and making it more meaningful. We also like to thank the organizers who work behind the screen for this session. And we do hope to meet you in person next year in 20 at 80 p.m. Till then, wherever you are, stay safe and healthy and take care of your loved ones. Goodbye.